Want to hear something amazing? Discover matches all the cash back you earn on your credit card at the end of your first year automatically with no limit on how much you can earn. How amazing is that? In fact, it's even more amazing because of all the places where Discover is accepted, and that's 99% of places in the U.S. that take credit cards. So when it comes to Discover, get used to hearing yes more often. Learn more at discover.com slash yes. 2021 Nielsen Report. Limitations apply. Pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement, welcome to another Rewind episode of The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, or like the neighborhood kids at their lemonade stand say, Fintern, thanks for making us rich. If I knew how much kids were making selling lemonade, I would have started my own stand years ago. Doug says he'll help me get it started, but he also keeps talking about how great sun tanning and lemonade go together, and that I should grab him a sample first. So, I'm starting to think that that guy just wants free lemonade. Speaking of, our episode today is from 2018 and is great for anyone with children getting bored at home or for people just starting out, because our roundtable talked about teaching kids about money. They give lots of tips on how to start those early money conversations that you just don't want to miss. If you know about money, what did we miss? Write to Joe about it at joe at stackingbenjamins.com. Just don't tell him I gave you his email address. But why am I explaining all this to you when you can listen to this episode for yourself? This episode originally aired in 2018, so make sure to ignore any giveaways or mentions of current events. Enjoy FinTurn Out. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and say cheese, everyone. What a better day to pretend that you're actually happy the kids are at home all summer, driving you crazy. Is that you? Know a friend who needs help teaching their kids about money? Well, you're in luck either way. Because on today's show, we welcome a pack of money nerds. First, we welcome from the National Bank of Mom. Hey, I know that bank. It's our new friend, Maggie. And from famzoo.com, say help to the head zookeeper himself, Bill Dwight. And rounding out our roundtable from ConnieAlbers.com, we welcome Brad Pitt. I'm kidding. It's just Connie Albers. But that's not all. In the middle of today's podcast, we'll chat to grandparents and people with nieces and nephews about how to talk to kids about money. From TIAA, we welcome wealth management advisor Kate Ryan. We'll also answer a bloom call for help about money-themed vacations and wash it all down with some of my, what many of you call, adorable, yes, I mean adorable trivia. And now, a guy who knows something about kids because people say he still is one, Joe Saul Sihai. Well, people might say I'm a kid, and I think I kind of fit that description. Hey, everybody, I am Joe Saul Sihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And you know what? We ditched our roundtable team today, and we brought in the A-team. So forget Len and Paula and OG, because we've got some awesome people hanging out on my dad's shortwave. Let's call first to a guy you've heard here before a couple times in uh, Palo Alto, California. It's our good friend, Mr. Famzu himself, Bill Dwight. Man, how are you? Hey, Joe. Good to hear from you. I know. it's been. A, how long has it been since you've been on the show? Maybe a year and a half? I didn't think I'd ever be back here again after that last performance. <laughs> after last time, that was so embarrassing. You sure doesn't the B team? <laughs> we can't. We can't tell the people, team. we can't talk about what you did, but no, I'm, I'm joking. So for the people that don't know about fam zoo, even though we talk about you all the time, tell everybody just a little bit about what you do over there at the zoo. Yeah. We put together a collection of prepaid cards and financial education for kids all wrapped in one family finance app. So basically it's training wheels for the products that they'll be using as adults and allows parents to teach their kids good money habits like what's compound interest hey maybe i should uh save and give a little before spending you know basic stuff like that it's so awesome and it's at famzoo.com or better yet stacky forward slash famzoo that's probably better (laughs) 
And then from National Bank of Mom, and uh, Doug knows that bank, as he said, it's our good friend, our new friend, Maggie, out in Pittsburgh. Maggie, how are you? Hey, Joe, I'm good. How are you? Good. What made you decide to create a blog teaching kids about money? I wanted my son to be a little bit further ahead than I was in my mid to late 30s. So once I got my act together, I thought, "Mm, I'm going to start earlier. How'd you come up with the name National Bank of Mom? That's so awesome. You know, I'm really not sure. I was basically looking for domain names and seeing what was still available. And uh, that was one of the ones that was still available. And I am the bank of mom because I pay interest. We, we did that with everything else and came up with Stacky Benjamins that way. <laughs> Perfect. And the person who had to search long and hard for her domain name from ConnieAlbers.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's our good that was a tough one. <laughs> it's our good friend, Connie Albers. Connie, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here with all these A listers. It's pretty exciting. I got C listers. I, I got to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and one C. Oh. <laughs> I got to talk about one thing that you have done um, that I know that everybody else is about to know is you worked with a good friend of mine who's a little mouse. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. You going to tell the rest? No, you tell the rest. So you worked yeah. at. We worked at the mouse house. What did you do with uh, Mr. Disney? Well, I had the opportunity to do several things, but when I kind of was completing my career with them, I was a spokesperson for the company. So I would travel around the Eastern coast, up and down the Eastern coast, and I would bring smiles to millions and millions of people around the world. That's got to so be. So I would take a character with me and we would do radio and TV. And, you know, the whole thing was to promote families coming and sharing memories and creating memories together and and enjoying time away from, you know, the daily grind of life. And I loved being able to do that, to share that magic. And speaking about families, you write all the time at ConnieAlbers.com about families, and you have put five children through school? Five children through college. Yeah. And they all went to the same college, right? Yeah. So I'm currently serving on the University of Central Florida with their family and parent council 11 years, we had kids in college, and nine and a half of those years, we had two or three in college at one time. And the thing that most families want to know about is how did they all graduate debt-free with no college prepay and no student loans? And that's sort of the message and the mindset I'm pretty passionate, because it's doable. You just have to build it into your kids, which is what both Maggie and Bill are doing, and, and you as well. I don't know. You made it through with a nice mane of hair, and I lost mine. Just putting two through <laughs> school. My hair's I'm going to that. <laughs> I was going to say, Bill, uh, you have four children? We have five, actually, and our five. fifth is headed to college uh, in two years. <laughs> but, uh, it- four through college so far. Gotcha. Four through college. I I just uh, uh, disavowed the fifth one for some reason. I didn't remember <laughs> something. <laughs> Came close. Did you know with the More Rewards credit card from Navy Federal Credit Union, you can earn three times the points at supermarkets, food delivery, and gas, plus one point on everything else? Your rewards won't expire while your account's open, and you can redeem them for cash, travel, gift cards, and more. So, stackers, if you pay your bill off in full every month and you're not paying interest, you'll know that the More Rewards card has some pretty special rewards. Plus, the More Rewards card is contactless, so you can make payments quickly and securely with just a tap of the card. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself with that new ride to get to work. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app online or by phone, and it's super fast. You can get a decision in seconds. Right now, rates are as low as 1.79% APR. Plus, with Navy Federal's car buying service, Powered by TrueCar, which will save you hundreds or thousands of dollars. Don't go to Navy Federal and get a car without using Navy Federal's car buying service powered by True Car. It is amazing. And coupled with that 1.79% APR, I think they've got you covered. So with that, you can shop, you'll compare and save on your new or used car. So whether it's your first car or your dream car, Navy Federal can help you cruise into a car that you can afford. At Navy Federal, our members are the mission. 
insured by NCUA, open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families like me. American Express is a registered service mark of American Express used by Navy Federal under license. Credit and collateral subject to approval, rates subject to change that are based on creditworthiness, rate available for new vehicles. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. We've got a great show today. We've got a fantastic call, but first we have a headline, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from Kiplinger. Uh, This piece is written by Margarita Chang, certified financial planner. Five fun ways to teach kids about money. Maggie, I'm going to have you kick it off. Do you mind uh, telling everybody, because obviously our audience hasn't read this piece like, like we have, what this is all about? Yes, absolutely. So the five items are remember the past. Um, It talks about like how you grew up and your family tree and looking at your relatives' careers. The second one is look for spare change. Um, There's a lot of spare change on the ground, in your house, things like that. Collect it. What are you going to do with it? Um, The third one is plant a seed. So talking about planting actual seeds and how that relates to your money growing over time. The fourth one is start a small business um, and talking about expenses and profit. And the last one is working with the community and how money helps support organizations and how you can volunteer. Let's peel these off. We're halfway through summer, guys. And let's start off with this idea, number one, remembering the past. Connie, is this something that you did with your kids while they were growing up? Absolutely. I I think it's really important. They need to understand what it was like when you started off, um, the good things that you did and the, the bad choices that you made. And if we would have made better decisions, And if our parents would have taught us differently, we would have started off uh, a lot further down the road, probably like a lot of, you know, most Americans and maybe even some of you. So we just, we just talk about it, which kind of goes with point three, I believe it's like planting a seed. Every time you have that conversation, you're, you're planting a thought and an idea. You don't have to go to, you know, great lengths to explain it, but just plant the idea of what life can be if I think that's important. In terms of doing that, Maggie, with regard to what Connie's talking about, how often do you let your son in on conversations about like household expenses and things going on, maybe utility bills or paying the bills or things like that? All the time. We talk about money all the time. I think at some point he's just tired of it. Like, oh my gosh, mom, another conversation about this. But we sit down and budget together. Um, When we're out at the store, I'm very like, hey, let's make this a lesson. You know, we do activities. And so we're always talking about money. He is always hearing whatever opinions or thoughts I have about it. And I'm hoping something is sticking. Bill, but so I, Maggie, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Joe, Maggie. So does he ever say, mom, everything's not a life lesson? He doesn't yet um, because he is still nine and he's still like, mom, I love you so much, but I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting for it. I'm just waiting Wait for one of those these years. days. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Connie, you never got the eye roll, did you? Oh, just a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, it's funny because FamZoo is built on obviously money being different for kids now than before. Is talking about the past as important as talking about how things are different now than they used to be? Oh, I think uh, conversations about the past are great, especially when you bring in the grandparents. That's a great way for the other generations to connect with your kids. And sometimes money can be a bit of a friction point directly with the parents. And so, you know, it's a less confrontational when it's a conversation with the grandparents. In my case, growing up in Silicon Valley, my father being a, one of the pioneers in the Valley in terms of being founding the first company to commercialize the laser, there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. And you can go to the grocery store and see items scanned and say, hey, you know, that's Grandpa Herb's technology right there. So there's some great lessons, even if, you know, your grandparents weren't entrepreneurs or whatnot, they were probably entrepreneurial in some other way or had some interesting, you know, money life stories to share with the kids. And I, I've found it's been a great connection point. My family, where I grew up on the west side of Michigan, is known as the blueberry people. So we would go to the, you know, the fruit aisle and there's great. <laughs> Yours invented the laser. Mine picked blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's all good. Uh, you know, it's a great way for them to feel connection with their past and their family tree. So um, I actually think uh, money is a sort of an overlooked topic to share amongst the generations. Well, let's stick with you, Bill, though. I'm pitching pennies number two because this is the tactile feel of money. Obviously, kids today aren't spending dollars or coins like they used to in the past. 
Well, the main message I, I took away from that one with the idea was basically collect, you know, coins during summer, put them in a family communal jar and then use them for a communal activity. Uh, a couple of things I love about that. One is that a little bit of money adds up. And so whether you're doing it with the change jar or electronically, you know, some of these products have like Roundup on the change where you, you, know, you buy something for 450 and so you throw 50 cents into the savings bucket. You know, kids should learn that if you do that consistently over time, it builds up and is real money. And then I also like the idea of sort of, you know, having a pot of money that everyone's contributing to in the family, that they can do a, a, a family activity together, whether it's saving up for, you know, part of a trip for Disneyland or something like that. And when they're teenagers, you can that's what you can turn the swear jar into. <laughs> <laughs> not that any teens I know swear, but you know. Not, not, not at creative. all. Yeah, mom swear jar is I'm talking kids. about your kids. Right, well, <laughs> I was going to say mom upstairs in the basement has uh, the swear jar constantly filled by OG and Doug. So uh, I know the swear <laughs> jar very well. Maggie, w when it comes to the side that this doesn't talk about, though, that I was kind of alluding to in my question with Bill, you know, your son is growing up in a, in a time when it's all about plastic. How do you teach your son about plastic and about the dangers of that? So this is a really awesome question and really well-timed. So we've been working with paper, um, you know, pencil. This is how to write a ledger, um, you know, do your register. Um, and I pay him in cash, so I always have to have cash. And just the other day, we got our first FamZoo cards. So we are going to transition um, to plastic now that he'll be 10 next week. So I thought it'd be a good birthday present. I did not um, pay for this spot. I know. I did. It, yeah, it was <laughs> not on purpose. And then I'm hoping to, in a few years, open up an account um, at our credit union. So when he's 12, we can have a joint account. So I thought that would be good to go from there. So I think this is a great topic, Joe, because there there are some well-known financial experts that will say, just use cash and coins with your kids because it's tangible. And it's 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 quite proven that if you use cash, you spend less. My problem with that is what kids do we know growing up today are going to be using a lot of cash when they're adults? I mean, they're not. So I want them to learn how to use a card responsibly early while I'm there to coach them instead of keeping them in the dark and then having them run off and make, you know, painful mistakes later. To Bill's point, Connie, my parents, yeah. great people, knew, I mean, taught me a lot of stuff, but they never taught me about plastic. And when I got to the Citadel, I found the American Express card table. They offered me, I don't remember if it was a blanket or a t-shirt or a Frisbee, but it was one of those. I had an American Express card in my pocket and within 90 days, I completely destroyed my credit. How did you, mm. how did you teach your kids about credit, especially when they transitioned away from home to college and beyond? Yeah. Well, we started with a pen and paper, kind of like Maggie did, you know, you start with that because it's tangible and kids learn in a tactile form. But as they move through middle school and then on into teenage years, um, the reality is, as you know, Bill said, we don't live in a cash only society. So we've got a credit card for each one of them with me as the co-signer. So it's like my name was on the card, but they had it. And I still made them keep a ledger during their high school years so they could see, all right, we've done the pen and paper and that actually works. Now we're doing this credit card, but we still have to pay attention to that bill when it comes in. Do the receipts match the charges on the card? What do you do about it? Because like Bill said, man, when they hit college and like you said, um, it could be a free for all and they can get themselves in trouble really, really fast. I think one thing that we did that's very different than most families, and that was we didn't use the credit card with a, a mindset of this is going to build your credit. No, that's not why we're charging things on a credit card so you can build credit. Maybe that happens, but the goal is to just a, a convenient way for you to manage the money you have in your account. Got Does that you. Make you know, sense? on that uh, on that topic, the you're you're absolutely right that a credit card does build credit and a prepaid card, for example, ours do not. And so there's an interesting approach that some parents might consider, which is like a hybrid model where you use a prepaid card to kind of stay on budget because you can never spend more than what's on the card. And then maybe use a credit card for a small recurring expense that's fixed. And that way you can kind of get the best of both worlds where you've got predictable expense, maybe on a credit card, helping the, the young adult to build credit and the, the unpredictable other expenses on a prepaid debit card where you can't overspend and there's no overdrafts. True. I think you can go get credit cards, though, with a fixed limit as well, or at least, you know, we did with our kids where we only allowed so much to be charged on that card. And they they kind of learned that the limit is placed on them. And as it slowly increments up, 
they don't think about it because it's a zero balance at the end of the month. Yeah, so they definitely never, want to be paying that thing off. Yeah. yeah, they never switch. Now, mind you, mine are all in their 20s now, and literally none of them ever went hog wild on credit cards. Um, they use all of them, use them, you know, as form of their e-commerce business. We started with, um, I used, similar to what Bill's talking about, I didn't actually co-sign Connie, I just didn't want to co-sign uh, for the card. I didn't want to have one well, mess up and yeah. have that. So, so I decided to go the secure card route. And by the way, there's a great uh, first card section, yeah. not to knock a magnify money again, but magnify money is a great secured card section and how to help your kids get good credit. So stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money again for that. But the thing that we did was went there. We used a secured credit card, but then they also have something that I didn't have, which was tools available. And so we hooked that credit card also up to debitize. So the credit card then was automatically paid off like a debit card automatically. And that didn't excuse them. I love this idea of a ledger and keeping the ledger. Uh, we didn't do that. We closely monitored their bill with them. But um, but I love the idea of the ledger. But debitize is a cool tool also to make sure that your kid doesn't get in over their head pretty quickly. One last thing on that, Joe. I think mindfulness is the key thing that we're trying to get here. And one of the you know the problems with the cards is sometimes it can lead to some mindless spending. And so uh, that's why I like coaching kids to turn on the activity alerts every time they use the cards. So any transaction over like zero cents or one cent or a dollar, whatever you can get away with, have a, a text message sent to them so that they are reminded that they're spending so it isn't uh, mindless. Yeah, great, great. So, you know, point. it's interesting, Bill. I think the important thing to remember, and you could probably, because your kids are older, you tailor what they're allowed, what freedom they're given based on their maturity level and their responsibility level. Um, if you have yeah. a child who maybe is a little aloof or, you know, just has a real addiction to shopping, loves to buy the next greatest thing, you're going to have to put some different limits. Wouldn't you agree? Because you can't parent. Oh, I completely agree with that. With in money fact, uh, the same way, right? Our, our kids, all five of our kids are totally different. I think they had the same parents. Um, and, <laughs> you know, they used to say, oh, but, you know, dad, Taylor gets that. And I'm like, well, you're not Taylor. <laughs> you know, so I think you do cater to what the, uh, the, the money personalities are of your children. They can be very diverse. Yeah. And but I'm hearing all of us basically say the same thing. And that is intentionality, purpose. And not just letting, just not letting it happen. And you, yeah. you kind of make those conversations happen. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If you give your child a credit card and say, good luck, bad, th <laughs> bad things are going to happen. No coaching. Ma <laughs> Maggie, I want to go to you for this fourth one, starting a really small business. Uh, what do you think about your child being an entrepreneur during the summer months? I think it's a great idea. I don't know that we have found anything in particular that we'd like to do or how we'd like to go about it, but I am noticing that he's starting to talk about what if I sold this thing to get some money to do something or to save. We're not there yet, but we have been talking about it, but I think it's a great idea. You mentioned your you kids. Know, one thing you might try, sorry, Joe, is one of my kids when he was young, he was really into cartooning. And so he made uh, custom T-shirts on Cafe Press and sold them that way. So, <laughs> you know, the, uh, and, and by the way, grandparents are a great uh, market. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what what's neat today is with the Internet, there's some really interesting opportunities for, you know, small businesses, you know, quote, small businesses for kids that didn't exist in the past uh, beyond sort of the lemonade stand or whatnot. And in fact, you can go to a, a another option is sometimes for older teens is to go to nextdoor.com, which is kind of a neighborhood site where the, the neighbors are generally verified. And sometimes people will post stuff like, hey, I'll pay you 40 bucks to move these four planters, you know, things oh. like that. There's a lot of opportunities out there. Yeah, that's cool. Connie, you were talking about e-commerce. You mentioned e-commerce with your kids. When did they start their e-commerce business? Um, my oldest one started when he was in high school and um, he started hmm, purchasing tickets and, you know, flipping them, uh, things like that. And it's actually turned into quite a, a good business, side business for him. Uh, that's certainly his evening job. The other kids, they sold services online. So I have a photographer and she would she would offer portraits. And obviously they're high school level, but hey, for 10 bucks, you can get a headshot. That's cheaper than going to somebody else. Um, my son did videography. So he would do videos of various things like people's houses for insurance purposes. We live in Orlando. We have lots of hurricanes, things like that for both of them. Now, an interesting entrepreneur story with my daughter. And I think this ties into the whole realm of everything. 
I saw a desire for her with food and I could just kind of see it happening. I gave her our entire grocery budget, a family of seven for the month. And I said, hey, you can have this entire budget. I don't care what you buy or what you make, but you're going to do the shopping and you just have to make sure there's dinner for all of us. And she learned budgeting. She learned much, you know, she learned that if she messed up a recipe, we wouldn't starve. I, I found that real life application connected with their passion. So you notice I said a videographer and a photographer and now a chef. All of them went on to college and for those vocations and they learned real life monetization just from what we had around them. And they've all gone on to make it their career. So I think that's a great message to mix it with their passion, you know, whether it's the cartooning and and one of our sons uh, builds computers. So we got into a little business of building computers for other kids, you know, so I think matching it with their passion as opposed to yours, (laughs) which is a mistake of parents, (laughs) Uh, it's a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are five decent ones and connect with your community. I'll just let people read. We'll link to the article in our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. I thought these were okay. I thought they were a good kickoff, but I know that the three of you have some great fun summer tips to teach kids about money. Maggie, if you've got one fantastic tip to teach kids about money, I was I was I was reading your piece about looking at buying in bulk versus purchasing <laughs> the small stuff and how tied is the same price even if you bought a ton of it, which I, I guess I have to learn, but Tell me some of the the fun summer stuff you like to do with kids. So I'm not sure that that's probably the best example of fun, (laughs) but it was nice to go to the store and not buy anything. And my son did like to sort of do an activity instead of kind of being dragged along. Um, It was something that made him be able to engage with the store. So we basically just went to a few stores. We did some price comparisons, you know, in a variety of posts. Yeah. So a really fun one though. So I guess maybe... One that I really like for the summer is whenever we go on vacation or whenever we go on a road trip, we talk about how much we want to spend ahead of time. And then we keep track of all our receipts and we kind of group everything together. And then we see how much we spent at the end. So it gives us a good chance to talk and decide what activities we're going to do together um, instead of, you know, me making all the decisions or, you know, him saying, I want to buy everything that I see. You know, we actually get to talk about it. Connie, how about you? Kids home halfway through the summer, bored to tears? Yeah, we get involved in, and I love this point of the community. I have each kid pick a cause that's really near and dear to their heart. So it could be homeless, it could be other items. And we specifically take up the money that they've earned over the summer from doing various projects. And we go and purchase different items that will help that cause. So I connect the community with their passion cause with their money. Awesome. Bill, how about you? Uh, Well, back on Maggie's note, I like to get the kids involved upstream in the vacation planning. So if you kind of put the challenge to them, hey, we want to do X, like we want to go to this theme park or whatnot, put the kid in charge of researching how to save money at the the theme park and, and the budget for the theme park. And it's got, you know, a couple of benefits. One is they start to appreciate the vacation and how much it actually costs, because some of them have no idea. And two, they've, you know, they feel more engaged and more ownership over the vacation. So uh, I think that's a good uh, technique to use up front to kind of get their interest in buying. Biggest takeaway for parents or anybody hoping to, whether it's a child or somebody else to teach them about money? I think uh, conversation is is my best takeaway. You want to talk to kids about money, uh, what you did wrong, what you hope to do better, something that you did right, and kind of open open that um, channel of communication. Um, I think kids are really interested in money. And I think a lot of um, parents and adults are a little bit scared of it. And they're not sure what to say. And they maybe think they're going to say the wrong thing. But just talking about it, I think is a really great step forward. That's a whole different conversation, isn't it? I think a lot of us are afraid to, I think my parents are afraid to talk to me about credit because they weren't great about credit. So, you know, then I consequently learn learn nothing and learn the wrong things. Uh, Connie, how about you? Yeah. So mine is paint a picture of possibilities and reiterate what that looks like constantly. It's a step-by-step approach. It's not a one-time conversation, but when you keep articulating, giving them a vision or a, or a picture of what their life could be like at X time, you know, they start to move toward that themselves without you pushing them in that direction. Doesn't Bill paint a picture of possibilities sound like something a Disney person would say? <laughs> 
<laughs> Bill, when you wish upon a star. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't think about that. I just made my own. <laughs> it just, it's yeah, that's the big thing. Paint it's, a picture for them. You know, you're guiding them. You got to be thinking about in money, we're guiding them, not pushing them because they're never going to adopt what we shove on them or force them to do. But we want to bring them to that desire of wanting a better future or a better life or the possibilities. Yeah, great. Bill? I agree with that. And, and, and the key thing is they got to discover a lot of these things on their own with your guidance. So I like the repetition that Connie's talking about. And I like the uh, communication that Maggie's talking about. And the the key piece for me that I would throw in there would be the hands-on experience. You know, like I like to send my kids to the store with the card and say, go buy ice cream for the family. Why? Because A, they have to have enough balance on their card to buy the ice cream. And B, they learn how much ice cream actually costs, which some mm -hmm. kids have no idea. And then just say, I'll reimburse you as soon as you get back. So we like to use this sort of reimbursement approach so that kids, you know, you're basically putting the responsibility in their hands. And it ties into a quote that I love from Dear Abby, which is, if you want to keep your kids' feet on the ground, put some responsibility on their shoulders. Mm. Nice. So, Bill, so you send them to the store for ice cream. You tell them you'll reimburse them. And then you don't and teach them about scammers. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I Conan O'Brien said I eat 33% of it and teach them about taxes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so great. Kate Ryan is a wealth advisor with TIAA and she's upstairs talking to mom. We're so excited she's on the show because one thing that people think about, they think, well, I don't have any kids. Well, if you have nieces or nephews, grandkids, neighbors, kids, whatever it might be, there are also tips for you. And TIA has those today. So here she comes, uh, Kate Ryan coming down to the basement. Kate Ryan coming down the stairs. How are you, Kate? I'm good, Joe. How are you? Well, I'm better now that you're here because I <laughs> I love this idea of talking to grandkids, aunts and uncles. You know, if you're not a parent, you still can help with a kid's uh, ability to handle money. Yes, absolutely. So TIA conducted a nationwide survey that showed a whopping 97%, Joe, of young people worry about saving for their future including college. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but there's good news. It's not just that parents can help their kids. As you mentioned, grandparents, aunts, and uncles can absolutely be an important part of the conversation. Unfortunately, that's not often the case. In that same survey, we found that only 8% of grandparents say they are likely to start a conversation. Yeah. And it makes sense to me, Kate, because, you know, I know with my kids, they're 23 now, but when they were growing up, I'd get the eye roll, right? Oh, dad's talking to me about money. But if grandma does it or Aunt Kate does it, it's a whole different conversation that the kid might think is pretty cool. Exactly. So it, can, it takes a village. It'll be, it's a team effort. The good thing is 85% of young adults say they are open to talking with their grandparents about money and saving. According to the, our study, only three in 10 grandparents think they can influence their grandchildren's money habits, yet 73% of young adults indicate their grandparents actually do influence their saving and spending habits, and 59% rate their grandparents as very good or excellent savers. Oh. Um, so this is an integral part of my practice where I do a lot of multi-generational planning and really focus on helping facilitate the conversation. And oftentimes, this is something that grandparents, aunts and uncle, uncles have at the top of mind, but they're not really sure how to start the conversation. Yeah, I think it would be hard, Kate, because, you know, it's they're not your children, right? They're somebody else's child. So it, to some degree, you think that you're stepping on mom and dad's toes if you do it, but to your point, really, you aren't. You're just trying to trying to start a conversation and, and make it a little bit more fun. Yeah, I actually I love that you brought that up because what I usually do is incorporate. So if we have a grandparent, a lot of my clients in retirement will want to incorporate funding their grandchildren's education as part of their financial planning. 
So what I'll typically do is also incorporate the parents in the conversation as well so that we can partner together and develop the right strategy to complement either what the parents are already doing or where they feel that they need the most help. And that makes it feel like no one's stepping on anyone's toes and everyone's kind of on the same page. And I find that what really prompts these conversations um, and is sort of a good segue into initiating the conversations are life events. So I mentioned retiring. That helps prompt them. Birthdays, graduations, things like that. Well, let's dive in then, Kate. Let's start with uh, if uh, children are under eight years old, kids just starting to kind of grasp that uh, money's a little bit more than taking a piece of plastic out of your wallet and (laughs) handing it over to the person at Target. What do we do? I think it's really important, even for young children, as I mentioned, to understand how we make decisions and use our resources to reach our goals. So tip number one um, would be tell your story. Introduce the idea that the prices of things have changed a lot in your lifetime. That's one way to tell your story. So for example, you might say, you know, a movie when I was younger was $6 and now it costs $20. Kids like to be engaged and that's a way that it's a bonding experience and it's a way that gets them thinking in a way that's relevant. Two is teach value. So show a young child the differences between coins and bills. And then from there, you can introduce the idea of value by assigning a dollar amount to some toys. You can even barter and ask your young grandchild if he or she thinks trading a cherished toy for a cookie is a fair exchange. Tip number three of five, play a shopping game. Playing store or family will help kids understand all of the things we have to buy in order to live the way we want to live, but in a way that's fun. Four, make a lesson out of everyday adventure. So something as common as just a trip to the grocery store provides a great opportunity to talk about money, value, and savings. An example I see, and that I used to play with my parents actually, was guessing how much, for example, like a box of cereal costs when they were young um, and me guessing how much it costs now. You said earlier, Kate, you know, a trip to the movies, a trip to the yeah. movie that used to cost five bucks now costs what, what, $89 and 40 cents. And then, and then yeah. you get your popcorn on top of it, which is another $300. So oh no. <laughs> yeah. The fountain sodas too. Right. You're really going all out with the fountain sodas. Yeah. Right. yeah. Anyway, number five. <laughs> Sure. So number five is, I mentioned life events earlier, birthdays. Bring up savings at birthdays. Help kids earmark portions of their birthday and special holiday money for money for spending, saving, investing, and maybe giving to charity. If, if they're younger, probably more along the lines of money that they want to save for maybe a toy and you're marking how much they want to save for the future. I like that idea, Kate, because it's early uh, lessons in goal setting, right? Which something, as you see in your practice, I'm sure adults don't do enough goal setting. They often want to know how to <laughs> diversify their money, and yet it's for no reason. So introducing kids to I've got this goal and saving and having these milestones, I think is a great idea. Yeah, it is. I, I think it's a really important fundamental that will carry them and serve them well throughout all of life. Let's yeah. toggle over to the middle age kids, maybe ages eight to 12. Sure. So middle childhood is packed with wonderful bonding opportunities to help inspire children to think clearly and responsibly about financial matters. So that being said, number one, separate wants from needs. Point out the difference between necessary expenses and short-term desires. It's really important that kids learn there's a difference between wants and needs and that they can't just have everything they want or that they come across. Money isn't simply the means to get fun stuff. It's a tool and part of growing up is learning how to use that tool. So, Um, So it sounds like we're talking a little bit more now about responsibility. Exactly. Part of what comes with responsibility is tip number two is setting goals, which we had talked about before. So talk about goal setting in general and financial goals that they have a vested interest in. So for example, do they need a laptop computer for school? Help them plan to save 
and shop for comparisons for it. Number three is hire your grandchildren, niece or nephew. So inviting kids to help out on projects around your home or business, pay them an hourly wage. So they get the concept of working for money. I love that idea, Kate. And I had a client back when I was a financial planner who did that. You know, he not only would hire his kids and his nieces and nephews, he would withhold taxes and he'd, he'd oh like, my. like these fake taxes and he would uh, have them put that away into a savings fund, but it was out of their hands. They, they, it was non-negotiable because he wanted to teach them about the man in all quotes, you know, yeah. ahead of time. So yeah, this, this is something that they have to think about in the future. Right. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so, so he's the only person I knew whose kids were worried about tax shelters, like at a very early how age. How old were his kids? <laughs> right. At like 12 years old, kids asking about tax shelters. It's crazy. I'm sorry. Oh, but that's great. Yeah. What's our next point? So number four is talk about the value of education. Kids will need to understand how doing well in school creates more choices for them later on in life. And you can help them understand what this means for their future financial mobility in a way that's inspiring, most importantly, and not ominous. So being positive is key here. So for example, you could speak to your grandchild about if you do well in school and you get into a good college, you can go to be a marine biologist and spend all of your time with the dolphins. Or if you do well and you get into a good school, you can be an architect and spend your time building giant buildings, helping them dream and in ways that's tangible and relevant to them. And then let's talk about older kids. Yeah, sure. So kids 12 and up. Tip number one for these kids is listen to their worries. Saving money for that first car or affording class trips may be high on their list of worries. Um, and that's okay. It's actually a good thing. Kids might need someone to just listen and maybe guide them to help keep the big picture in mind. I think also guiding them on just getting them started to start saving and kind of showing, okay, if this is what our goal is, if we save this much a month or this much a week, then by this point in time, you'll have enough saved to do what you want to do. I love that Kate is a first one because at that age, I think that's the first age when kids kind of start I mean, they worry about a lot of things. And at this age, often they'll hide it from mom and dad, but a, but a grandparent or a cool aunt or uncle, they might share with them some of the worries they have that they don't think they want to share with mom and dad. Yeah, it's true. Exactly. Yeah. So tip number two is help with the work. So encourage your team to take part in a part-time job, at least in the summer. There are also endless ideas online for teen entrepreneurs, um, so you can research them together. For example, one of my colleagues actually, with his son who is a junior in high school and is very into sneakers, created sort of like a, a pop-up shop where he sold sneakers and the money that was raised from the sales was going towards his college education. And that was something fun, got him thinking about money, got him thinking about saving, and it was a bonding experience too. Three, offer to match their savings at a rate that's comfortable for you. If they earn taxable income, uh, you mentioned taxes earlier, <laughs> encourage them to open an IRA or a Roth IRA would maybe be even better. And this is an amazing chance to talk about the power of compound interest and the power to save when they are young. What I also think is just as impactful is this is a great way to set a sound foundation where they're more likely to save towards in the future. So starting is the hardest part, but if you help kids get started, they're more likely to keep those habits going and save towards that account in the future. I found some fun math with kids that are like 14 years old about the rule of 72, Kate, is a lot of fun because if you take a look at, you know, let's say an 8% rate of return, you uh, divide that into 72, what's that, nine years? You take your mind double. So for a 14-year-old, their money's going to double then at 23, 32, uh, 41, 50, uh, 59, so five times before they're 60. So I remember telling 14 year olds when I was speaking at high schools, like if you save a thousand dollars, which I know is a lot of money, it's not a thousand dollars 
it's 2000 the first time it doubles, then it's 4000 then it's 8000 16 You've saved $32,000 by the time you're 60. And it's amazing to see like the look on kids' faces, right? Yeah. Yeah, that'll provide some motivation. Right. Um, exactly. And I think, I think helping them, it's sometimes hard for people when they don't see the immediate benefits, but helping them visualize what this means for the future. And the rule of 72 is a great example. One of my best friends talks about all the time about how her grandfather taught her the rule of 72. And that's, she's taken with her throughout her life. It so. is so fun. What else for older kids, yeah. Kate? So help with goal setting. It's number four. Some large expenses in high school may actually be useful, as I had mentioned, such as buying a car, to get around and from work. Before they're old enough to drive, help your young teen set a goal and work hard to achieve it. So planning ahead of time for the budget needs to be or what the savings need to be to be able to purchase something like a car. Anything else for older kids? Three more points. Uh, number five is be honest about expenses. So speak frankly about what it takes to rent an apartment and run a household. So for me, I think this is a great opportunity to speak about budgeting. That was one of the most important financial lessons that I learned as a young child is, was budgeting. So this is a time where kids are older and are doing activities without their parents, are going to college, and are therefore opening debit card accounts. So focusing on the cash flow of money coming in and money coming out to make sure that they stick to some sort of budget is a good opportunity to do this. And this is a good segue to my next point, which is talking about credit. Educating teens about personal finance, particularly credit cards. So to be wary of credit card promotions and remember to, to spend within their means. Wow, that's great because kids that age start seeing credit cards and, and if they if you don't teach them, I think they, they immediately think using somebody else's money is pretty cool when, you know, <laughs> I think our fans here know that that destroyed my credit because nobody really talked to me about that. And I got to college and thought that, hey, having an American Express card was awesome and truly wasn't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Didn't quite work out how you were <laughs> no. hoping, but yeah. And I think establishing a budget sooner rather than later is such an important piece of a strong future. And I see that all the way up through my clients who are retiring. We've got to run, Kate, but where do people get more information if they want to take these with them? You can find more information at go.tiaa.org backslash save for college. Cool. And you know what? If you are out on your commute or you're walking the dog or wherever you might be, we've got you covered because we'll have that link in our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Kate, thanks for all these tips. I love the fact that you're bringing up that the grandparents and aunts and uncles can get involved too. And I think that's fantastic. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. It was great. Hey there, money nerds. I'm your favorite podcast engineer, Steve Stewart. And welcome to your favorite new part of the show, the part where Doug is still outside washing his El Camino and I get to do his trivia. Huh, my trivia questions would be way better than Doug's. Try this one on for size. The average adult understands 60,000 words, and I have it on good authority that Doug understands about 11, but that's not our question for today. Our question is this. While we're talking about money with children, how many words does the average six-year-old understand? I'll be back with the trivia and probably a new job doing Doug's trivia on this show that'll look so good on my LinkedIn profile in just a moment. Well, stackers, when you're done with us, I got another recommendation for you. Talking Real Money Podcast, my friends, uh, Don McDonald and Tom Cock, these guys, you've heard Don, of course, on the show many times here if you've listened to us for any length of time and not only 
do you get Don's voice for no additional charge? Of course, it's it's all free, by the way. You're going to get straightforward, honest advice on building the wealth you need for a more secure future. These guys have a unique skill set, both as broadcasters and financial experts. And because their show comes in variety of shapes and sizes, you've got uh, episodes on index investing, on individual stocks, on all of the uh, meme stock mania, on crypto, on building an emergency fund, on debt. They give you all the information you need so you'll learn to invest better, worry less, and spend less in fees and commissions. So check it out. Listen on your favorite podcast service or go to TalkingRealMoney.com. And you know what? We'll also have a link in our show notes here at StackingBenjamins.com. It's called Talking Real Money and give them a listen. Birthdays, holidays, promotions, getting that last sprinkled donut. There's a lot in this world we're celebrating, but nothing is worth celebrating more than knowledge, especially knowledge that'll pay off, like understanding how compound interest works, learning how to check your investment professional's background, or figuring out your risk tolerance, or finally understanding all those terms your friends keep throwing around like ETF, ESG, and ICO. Learn about these investment products and more at Investor.gov, your unbiased resource for valuable investment information, tools, and tips before you invest, Investor.gov. All right, gang, we went over backstage how we play this game. Price is right style without going over. We agreed that we would go in alphabetical order choosing who chooses first. So, Connie, do you want to go first, middle, or last? Middle. All right. Maggie, do you want to go first or last? I'm going to go first. All right. And Bill, that means you're going last. So Maggie, I don't want to go last. (laughs) (laughs) What's up with that? (laughs) All right. We're playing price is right style. The closest without going over. So here we go. The average, uh, as Doug said, uh, 60,000 words for the average adult. How many words does the average six-year-old understand? Maggie, what do you think? I'm going to guess 10,000. Because I like even numbers. (laughs) Shot in the dark with 10,000. One sixth of the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. All right, Connie. I'm going to say 9,000. So a little less. You think kids are a little dumber than Maggie does. (laughs) (laughs) Maggie, I don't know. We may be really, you know, surprised. (laughs) Bill, what are you thinking? Well, well, I I was going to say one, which would be yes, because they don't know no. Um, (laughs) But sure I'm going to go with 10,001. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it was a... <laughs> so that's, that? that's the way you play the game, Maggie. You just got hosed over. So, <laughs> so unless it's exactly 10,000, that's the way FAMSU works, folks. FAMSU's the card now. <laughs> right, right there. All right. Uh, what's our answer? Hey there, trivia fans. I'm your friendly engineer, Steve Stewart, back with your trivia answer. The question was this. While we're talking about kids and money, how many words does the average six-year-old understand? According to Schoolastic, the average child understands about 22,000 words, which makes Bill our winner. Way to go, Bill. By the way, the average six-year-old can only speak about 2,600 words, but they grasp a ton more than they're letting on. Now, if we could just help Doug understand 200-ish words, it very well could make this part of the show better. See ya! What? Oh my goodness. (laughs) I like it. All right, Bill. I feel bad, sort of. (laughs) <laughs> Maggie, welcome to You Got Screwed, the podcast. Okay. That's horrible. So, so, so now b- here's what we know, Joe. We now know that kids can understand way more than they let out. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so watch what you say around kids, right? You guys yeah. already already know that. Yeah. They're picking up a lot of stuff you don't think they are. Oh, oh, oh team. Looks like somebody needs help. All three of those O's are sponsored by Bloom. Smart, simple 401k management at Disney. Connie, you had a 401k, didn't you? I did. Remember how difficult it can be choosing which funds to pick and when to move them? Yes, absolutely. 
Bloom is a 401k management service that links to your existing 401k. So you don't have to move your money. You leave it right there. They're a completely independent advisor. So you know you're getting unbiased expert investment advice. They're a fiduciary. Bloom researches, invests, manages, monitors, and grows your 401k while you relax. And guess what? They get you in the right mix of funds to meet your retirement goals. So like a robo-advisor for your 401k. Best yet, they're priced at $10 a month regardless of your account size. If you know anything about target date funds in most 401ks, Bloom is a way better choice than a target date fund. Bloom is so simple. In fact, the hardest part about this is remembering there's three O's in Bloom. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash, guess what it is, Bill? Forward slash. FamZoo. No, Bloom. (laughs) (laughs) You can go to FamZoo, but you'll end up someplace different. (laughs) Bloom. That's right. That's stackybenjamins.com forward slash bloom and enter promo code SB and you'll get your first month free and you can see the difference bloom can make in your retirement. And today our bloom call for help comes from our new BFF, Nicole. Say hello, Nicole. Hey, Nicole. Hey, Joe and OG. I am looking for some help trying to plan a family vacation and I'm coming up a little empty. I need to go somewhere fun. And somewhere that maybe I can teach uh, my 11-year-old daughter a little more about finances and money in general. But, you know, it has to be fun, too. Where's a great place where we can all have fun? You know, I'm a little bit of a money nerd. I want to make it a little bit educational. But Mama needs to have some fun, too. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the question, Nicole. I know G's not here. But we've got a team of people that know about this topic. So, Maggie, you want to kick this one off? What do you think might be fun for an 11-year-old and Nicole? So, I don't think the destination has to be about money. I think you can incorporate talking about money and some activities no matter where you go. So, I would suggest that they sit down and figure out what kinds of things they like to do and what they would be happy with having done at the end of the summer. So, Connie, what Maggie's saying is take them to Disney and show your kids that spending six bags of money can be a blast. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) I'm sitting here thinking, okay, you have two choices. We can go hiking or we can go to Disney World. And um, (laughs) I'd be uh, teaching these kids that how they can go experience a wonderful memory-making vacation on a budget, and it's possible. And so Bill alluded to this before, teach them on the upside what the costs are and how they can save money because there's ways to have amazing vacations that your family can afford. You just have to do a little research. Maggie, you have your son Jay then help plan the trip? Yes, definitely. We sit down and talk about it. And this year we're going to go to Washington, D.C. He picked it. We're going to go on the off season in November when he has a little bit of time off. And we paid for our hotel using rewards plus $100. So four nights, breakfast, pool, um, all for $100. And we requested some free tickets uh, with our congressman for the White House and the Mint. I'm really hoping we get those tickets. And we'll see what we get. But, you know, those are some free activities. And, yeah, we've definitely been talking about things ahead of time. He even said, Mom, what can I do now to plan for our vacation And I was like, oh, my God, parenting victory. I was so excited. (laughs) The Mint's a great place. You could have said the Mint earlier. That's a fantastic destination. I didn't want it to be so, you know, so limiting because I think a lot of we're trying to make this relatable for people, right? How many people are really going to take their kids to a destination that is just about money? You know, I think that's a little bit unrealistic. So, you know, I think you can take your kids anywhere. And money is involved. So talk about money, you know, during the process, before, during, after. Gotcha. I don't know, Maggie, we took our kids to the Mint because I wanted them to see that million dollars under a glass case. Well, yeah. That they have <laughs> out there. I'm excited to go. I hope we get That's that ticket. That's what a million dollars looks like, kid. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the closest you get to a million dollars. There's no inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bill, how about you? These two wimped out and didn't give me a specific destination. I'd love to have you give Nicole maybe a specific spot you think where would be a good place to learn about money. I'm going to kind of wimp out. I'm going to say, look to the city nearby you. So for example, we live near San Francisco. It's one of those things where you often don't explore the city near you. So we did a nearcation got a hotel in San Francisco, about 45 minute drive, but to the kids, you might as well be across the country. 
And, uh, you know, I still remember that trip very well. They loved staying in the hotel. To them, part of the experience of just staying in a hotel is part of the allure. And we also went to Alcatraz, which you never do if you live near here. So I think you can do the combination of saving money and have fun just by doing a nearcation uh, instead of, you know, the hassle of the travel all the way across the country. And there, And I agree that the money lessons are everywhere. Like just... A simple money lesson is look how much things cost in the hotel versus in the 7-Eleven down the street. So, you know, when you have a captive audience, that's what I call the captive audience tax. You know, teach your kids that you got to plan ahead a little bit to get the best deals. And, you know, just buying them on the spot is not always the best deal. You know, Nicole talked about having an 11-year-old. And and because I do live in Orlando, Disney is like a nearcation for us. And it is what we took our kid. We took them there their entire life. But we had, we mastered the way of doing it very economically. We would pack our lunches. We didn't have to buy the, you know, attraction food. And the kids would all be part of that, as well as, you know, training them about the souvenirs that they may want and how they can earn money to buy a t-shirt or, you know, even caramel apple, whatever that is. But yeah, I love your idea about a nearcation. However, I think those bigger trips are certainly memorable, especially if you don't live in that area. They remember all the life lessons without you actually happen to remind them of all the life lessons. Absolutely. In fact, the most memorable trips for our kids have been the ones with extended family, with the grandparents. Oh, yeah. And they come to learn that it's really not about necessarily where or the luxury level. It's about the time spent. Uh, and you just get that kind of connection that you don't get in everyday sense when you're off on an adventure together. So, uh, you know, certainly a, a far vacation can be great. And especially if it's bringing in uh, extended family. We had I totally to- agree with that, too. And I think that kids really like simple things sometimes, too. You know, even just getting a pizza on Friday night, my son will be so excited. You know, playing some board games with family, you know, is, is way better than, you know, a lot of really expensive things. Uh oh, board game alert, Joe. Oh boy, we got no. He's a board game nerd, so he's. Gonna I noticed. Awesome. Yes. Payday, payday is our favorite board game. Yes, we got uh, payday right there along the wall here in the basement. Uh, we have the one version of Dad's shortwave where you can actually see into the basement. That's the, <laughs> the long way. <laughs> yeah, the long way, right? The video add-on tool. The funny thing is we had Robert Niles on at the beginning of summer talking about theme parks. And one thing, Connie, that we learned also about Disney was all the attractions that end in a uh, and in a gift shop. Right. And if for untrained parents, the can I have, can I have, can I have just really starts to wear you down. So what we did and we were taught this by a friend and we we did this then every time we went to a theme park was we had X amount that mom and dad were going to kick in to, I think Connie said this earlier, they could figure out themselves how to bring more money, but they got X amount of money. And when it was gone, it was gone. So at the end of the ride, they could choose that thing in the gift shop. If they wanted it, buy whatever you want. By the way, the lesson my friend taught me was don't say no, let them spend it on the dumbest trash ever. And that's painful. It's so hard to do. And hey, and if they don't spend it at all, let them take it home and save it. So it was funny speaking about my kids are twins. My daughter blew hers. We had a five day Disney vacation. Hers was gone within 20 minutes of getting to the park. (laughs) And my son took his home and put it in his savings account. But both of them learned some some pretty good lessons because my son really wanted this watch. And then later on, he asked us for a watch. And we said, well, you can use the money that you got, maybe order it online. And my daughter, we had to circle back later. Halfway through the vacation, she'd lost the toy, no idea where it was. And um, we had to have a long talk about that decision. Well, not a long talk, really short talk. But But um, a lot more powerful and memorable than you just saying no. Yeah, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You've got X to work with and you can make more. So, uh, you know, to your point, sir, I think that's awesome because when we are focused on helping them learn, and like you said, not saying no, they can look in their little change purse and their little wallet and do exactly what we do. We have to look and see, do we have the money for that? You know, our, our gadgets get more expensive than theirs, but it's just powerful because they learn that incredible character quality of self-control and self-restraint. But it's so hard. I remember thinking, even when when Autumn was buying the stuff, I I was thinking, this is horrible. Like, that's the worst thing. Why would you spend money on that? And I held my tongue, and Cheryl held her tongue. Then we circled back later and said, you know, we did the Dr. Phil. So how'd that work out for you? <laughs> You'll rub it in session. Love well, that. not really. Just, 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 hey, where's that toy you spent your money on? 
Yeah, good stuff. Thanks for the question, Nicole. If you've got a question for the show, head to stackybenjamins.com and at the top of the website, you'll see the questions tab. Click on that. You'll find all the ways to interface with us. Guys, that's going to do it. Thanks a ton for hanging out with us. Let's find out what's going on where you all live. Maggie, I've been talking about your site with everybody I know, National Bank of Mom. But uh, what do you got coming up here for the month of July? So I just finished post four of a five post series on spending. So we're talking about ways to spend um, maybe a little bit better. And the last post is going to be a little bit philosophical as in, do I really need to buy this thing? And um, previously we did a post, a five post series on saving and basically just kind of whatever comes up and, you know, what, whatever he's interested in or whatever I think I can, you know, teach him or, you know, something age appropriate or, you know, something that comes up in conversation with him, you know, I jump on it. And every once in a while I can get him to write a post. That's so we awesome. like to do that. We'll link to National Bake a Mom on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Connie, you are all over the place, not just with the blog. I see you like doing video as you're watching cruise ships go by. I watched that video. <laughs> yeah, I leave in the morning at 6 a.m. for Virginia. I'm speaking up there and then I head to Denver and then I'm off to Minnesota and then Missouri. So a little busy. Yeah. So what can people, if they go to ConnieAlbers.com, what are they going to find in July? I love to talk about teen stuff. So I'm really talking about developing a college-free mindset uh, because it doesn't start at college. It starts way before then. And that's a passion project for me right now because I see so many kids getting themselves in trouble and I know parents can help them with that. So that is what they'll find. All things related to the parenting of the teen and as it relates to helping them manage and cultivate debt-free life. Awesome. And we'll link to ConnieAlbers.com on our show notes at StackyBenjamins.com. Bill, you're always working on something at the FAM Zoo. Tell me what's coming up next. Well, if uh, parents are looking for like a bunch of practical tips about teaching their kids uh, personal finance along the lines of the Kiplinger article, our latest article on the uh, blog.famzoo.com is the top 30 tips we've had uh, over the years. We've been doing this for 11 years now. They're little bite-sized tips, and they're broken into uh, earning category, spending or not spending, saving, giving, and investing. So our our favorite tips there, uh, look for things like the family 401k. That's one of my favorites, getting those kids started on a Roth IRA early. That's awesome. Especially if they have a summer job. Oh, yeah. No, that's fantastic. That's great. And you see the, the compounding interest on that? Holy cow. And we'll obviously, as always, we link to FAMZU all the time, but but it's stackybenjamins.com forward slash FAMZU and uh, say hi to Bill over there. All right, Doug, you take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? First, hoping to teach your own kids about money? Get your hands dirty. Spending time talking and including your children in money-related topics is far better than just handing them cash or never letting them handle any at all. Building good financial skills requires parents to include chats about cash, but also allowing kids to learn some inexpensive lessons now so they don't make expensive mistakes as adults. Second, take some advice from Kate at TIAA. Lecturing grandkids or nieces and nephews about money isn't a great thing, but sharing money stories and mistakes and fielding questions, that's a great way to help them learn. Remember that kids are likely to want to learn from you because you aren't mom or dad, so step up to the plate and help relatives learn the basics. But the big lesson? Don't try to teach Joe's kids about money by playing cards. Well, not unless you're willing to fall for their, oh, let's play just one more hand of old made for money this time, Uncle Doug. Come on, kids, I needed that 20 bucks for happy hour down at the Sizzler. Give it back now. Special thanks to Connie Albers for appearing on today's show. Check out Connie's blog and where she'll be speaking at ConnieAlbers.com. Thanks, too, to Tutu. Thanks, too, to Tutu. Why are we talking ballets in these credits? Oh, oh, I get it. Sorry. Thanks also to Maggie from National Bank of Mom for joining us. Read all about her money lessons with her son at NationalBankOfMom.com. And thank you to our friend Bill Dwight from FAMZOO for taking part in today's festivities. Want to teach kids about money the modern way? Check out FAMZOO using our link, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash FAMZOO. And if you end up buying anything using that link, 
Bill and his team send a small thank you to our team for referring you. Finally, thanks to Kate Ryan from TIAA for joining the fun today. Interested in tips on teaching your grandkids, nieces, or nephews about money? We'll link to the TIAA research Kate talked about on today's show at our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com or visit TIAA.com for lots of resources on everything from retirement to 529 plans. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Okay, I've sat here trying to think of something pleasant to say after that, and I can't. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. The rules guys are this. If you're new to the after show, what happens here stays here. We don't talk about this section of the show and we rarely talk about money. So if you're here to talk about finance, we'll see you next time because we're not doing that, but we're blessed today to have it. And I think that's a good term. We're blessed today to have the three great parents here with us. And people think that great parents always have halos on their head and they get everything right. And so I thought it'd be fun to talk about some of your oops that uh, wasn't quite the good idea I thought it might be. And Connie, you're nodding your head. You've, you haven't had any of those, Connie. I'm just, you know, you have five kids. It's like, well, gosh, which story do I share? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my it's probably my worst mom fail, depending on how you categorize it. But, you know, I, I just think it was always so important. Of We had all the kids' friends over to our house so we could get to know the kids and our kids could interact with them. And there was just this one night we had a party and I asked uh, my youngest son, I even wrote about this in my book. I, I asked my youngest son to just do two simple things. Now, I'm, I'm sure your listeners, their kids always do what they ask when they ask, but mine didn't. And so I go into his bedroom and the lights are out, open the door and I broke my first rule and that was just turn on the light. So I just opened the door and I immediately launched into mom mode. Why didn't you do the dishes? I told you to do this. This was important to me that you do these dishes and you just went to bed. And he kept interrupting me going, mom, mom. And he finally yelled at me and he said, mom, I'm like, what? And I turned around and I turned on the light switch and I saw six eyeballs staring at me that were just bug eyed. And I got, I was so mortified. I turned around, I walked out the door because I just yelled at my son in front of his friends in the dark. They were scared to death. I start crying in the hallway thinking, you are a horrible mother. I go back into the bedroom. And now they're hiding under the blanket because they think she's coming back to finish the job. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm now, you know, just mortified and embarrassed. And they're probably texting their family saying, come and save me. This woman's crazy. But I had to apologize to all of them and apologize to my son in front of them. And it has now become this running joke with now they're all, you know, college and out of college and they still remember. And that, that story spread like wildfire. And when I asked my youngest, if I could tell that story, he says, Oh, absolutely. Mom, just tell all of it. <laughs> 
that was my biggest <laughs> mom moment. <laughs> that's every that's, level. That's that's fantastic. The, the turns out there's two moms. There's the nice mom they think they know. So here's my thing, Joe. Just always turn on the light first. <laughs> that, that could be scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maggie, how about you? So wow, my story isn't really as good. Um, and we have much less time to work with because he's still only nine. But last year, you know, the teacher always sends home the worksheets for the summer, like this huge stack of worksheets, you know, like your kids have to learn all summer long and, you know, otherwise they're going to lose three months of work. And I thought it would be great if I could pay him to do these worksheets. Like, oh, you let's set a goal. You'll do three worksheets a week. I'll pay you 50 cents per worksheet. Like I had this whole plan laid out. It, total bust. I mean, maybe a week, you know, this worked out and just fail. And I, I just thought like, oh, this is terrible. We're just, we're not even going to pretend to do the worksheets anymore. So it just not even going to worry about it. Throw them out. <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, we'll just put these right in the recycling as soon as the teacher sends them home. Uh, I felt so bad because I felt like we should be doing them, you know, and he should be learning. And, but I think some are like, you are learning. It's just maybe not in that same capacity. That's funny because like my kids, they'd send home the reading list every summer and we'd try to have them read all summer. And they'd say, oh yeah, we're reading. And then you go in their room and they're not, they're not reading at all. <laughs> like there's, there's, there's no reading going on. Uh, Bill, Bill, five kids. Hey Joe, this is the after show, right? This is the after show. <laughs> that nobody listens to, like my wife? N nobody. Right. <laughs> this is it. I'm throwing my wife under the bus right here. Oh, this is, <laughs> oh, it's, it, I see, it's not so, your parenting fail. Connie. Our boys um, were really into uh, World of Warcraft, so online gaming. So uh, we thought it would be a good idea if we kind of clued in a little bit about what World of Warcraft was all about. So my wife decided that she was going to start playing World of Warcraft with uh, the then uh, teen, our oldest teen. And uh, boy, she really got into it. And um, one day and uh, they were playing online and with my, one, my oldest son and their friend was over. And I came in after about two hours and I said, isn't Peyton at lacrosse practice? <laughs> she had completely forgotten to pick up our son, other son. <laughs> she got deep in the world because <laughs> she's busy playing online <laughs> gaming. Yeah, nice. Uh, yeah, she's a very popular mom. Well, except <laughs> yeah, uh, with the lacrosse staff. <laughs> she's like, I'll go get him in a minute. I just got to level up first. <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, I'm glad this isn't me. Is that right? <laughs> I like how you don't tell a bill parenting fail. That's good. <laughs> Every of those. That's Every day. That's that's very smooth. Mine, when my son, well, both my kids, they're the same age, right? But my son's seven, and I was pretty excited because his uncle, Tony, my brother, we call him Uncle Randy. He's my cousin, but he's a cousin on both sides. My mom, my mom's sister is married to my dad's brother. So every every family event we go to, my cousin Randy is there. So we call him Uncle Randy, even though he's he's not really an uncle. And I see him all the time. And he and my brother were best man and second man at my wedding. So we were really on a diagram here just to make sure there's nothing illegal. <laughs> yes. but, uh, you keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ar Arkansas is 800 yards that way. Just to, just to let you know. So we're very close, but I'm not my own grandpa, Bill. Just to, my I, wife's a geneticist. We'll hook you up later. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if you know that that song, but so my son is all excited because he loves these guys and he doesn't get to see them enough. We have fun, and my son at seven years old is excited because dad is letting him hang out with his two uncles and him. And of course, my brother and my cousin and I are drinking beer and we're telling stories. We're keeping them rated G or even sometimes maybe a little PG. But you can see the look on his face that he's hanging out with dad. And mom's excited he's hanging out with dad. Mom goes to bed. He gets to stay up a little late. We go to the basement and we are playing on the computer. We have these, the, you know, this is a while ago, but we have these these three game pads hooked up to NHL hockey. And my son played a little bit of NHL hockey with me. And so he sat and watched my cousin and my brother and I, we played this thing where we're the United States and we're going through this tournament. And so we had my son become the beer runner for us. And whenever our beer ran out... <laughs> Whenever our beer ran out, we'd have Nick just go grab us another one. And so Nick would grab us a beer and he's sitting there and he's cheering every time we'd score and we're high-fiving each other and we're including him. Well, you know what happens after you have too much beer? This is a horrible story with a seven-year-old. Uh, 
when you have too much beer, then you have to take a break. So then we would hand the controller to Nick while we went to take our break, right? And then we'd come back and have him get us another beer. At 2 o'clock in the morning, Cheryl comes downstairs, and we, we had no idea it was 2 a.m. <laughs> Cheryl comes downstairs and goes, have you made our son your beer runner? Like, <laughs> like, the most, like with the most disgusted look on her face. And I remember just the sheepish look on my brothers, my cousins in my face were like, yeah, it's 2 a.m. What the hell are you doing? I Seemed don't like know. a good idea at the time. <laughs> Seemed great. We needed somebody to get beer, and he's good at it. He's seven. He does whatever we tell him to do. Oh, See, this my. is why I don't tell my own stories. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it was horrible. That was my parenting fail. So. Joe just lost half his viewership right there. There it goes. Yeah, well, I'm saying don't do Oof. that. Don't do that. Yes. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for playing.